Chances are that if you're a humanist, you've thought long and hard about many issues, and you've changed your mind about a lot of different things. And at times you may feel like you're the only one who sees things the way that you do. So we have questions like, how do we free other people's minds? How do we encourage other people to do some critical thinking? And how do we encourage others to get involved in our community? Social scientists have discovered powerful strategies for social influence and persuasion. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Brittany Schutz Reinhardt with us today. Brittany has a PhD in social psychology from The Ohio State University, focusing on things like judgment, attitudes, decision making, and persuasion. And along with her background as a social scientist, Brittany has experience working with Todd Stiefel, the Foundation Beyond Belief, and the Le Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. In addition, Brittany is a mother, an atheist, a member of the humanist community, and a longtime resident of Central Ohio. Brittany will tell us how to encourage people to get involved in humanism. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Brittany Schuh. <laughs> Christian and you don't 
really want to be an atheist, you just, as soon as you see that word atheist, you're <coughs> um, So people avoid these counter-attitudinal messages. They choose pro-attitudinal messages instead. And even if they're engaging in bias processing, um, research that also came out of my lab has shown that when people think that they've successfully counter-argued, they become more certain in their initial position, even if their counter-argument is stupid. Right? So even if you're like, wait, that is so dumb. You're being ridiculous. If they feel like they've won, they are even more convinced and sure, and uh, it can prevent them from considering viewpoints in, in the future. So I think I had last time um, a little anti-atheist um, blurb in, on my handout that said something like, um, atheism, the belief that something evolved from nothing without anything makes perfect sense. And that makes a lot of sense to Christians, and then the, whoever thought of that was like, yeah, I'm certain that those atheists are stupid. And we're sort of like, what? <laughs> are, you, are you kidding? That's your best argument? Um, so this doesn't have to be successful resistance against arguments that are actually, you know, that an outside observer would be like, no, that's a really good counter-argument. What matters is the perception of the person. So this is why a direct approach, um, sort of attacking people on their beliefs, if our goal is to convert people or to convert this particular person, um, a good persuasion strategy might be to have the appearance of not trying to persuade. Um, and of course, now that I'm telling you this, we can all be sneaky persuaders. Uh, and there are a few reasons why um, these indirect routes uh, might be more um, successful. One is that people are more persuaded by likable people. So when somebody's getting up in your face and telling you how stupid they are, you don't really want to agree with them. Right? So, you know, if we're not getting up in people's faces and we're just sort of passively saying, like, this, you know, this is what I believe and this is why, um, it's more persuasive. I like to always preface um, things with, you know, it's your choice, but these are just my beliefs. That argument against self-interest is also more persuasive. By the way, that uh, citation is not me. There happens to be another person that studies similar things whose last name is Reinhardt, and they are not my spouse nor me. Um, <laughs> So both of those reasons are why I think uh, Camp Quest and the humanist community in general, um, these billboards from the Freedom From Religion Foundation, um, they might not be good ways of getting people to um, accept us necessarily, but they start people thinking about, you know, we value reason and compassion. That doesn't seem like such a bad thing, really. Um, Camp Quest is really careful to not say anything that's anti-religion. Uh, and I think that's another reason why it's a particularly good strategy because it's not putting people on the defensive. So what we want to do is we want to avoid people kind of arguing. Um, so narrative persuasion is another way of doing this. So storytelling decreases counter arguing and it also has been shown to increase persuasion. Um, so these stories where people tell their conversion stories, um, the Recovery from Religion Project and the Clergy Project are both two really good examples of some really powerful stories about atheist clergy, right? They go from uh, minister to atheist. So I have Teresa McBain um, being interviewed on CNN uh, as the illustration for this. Um, and another reason why you might not try to persuade people directly is because if you get them questioning, they'll come up with their own answers and people find their own arguments very persuasive. So the trick is to not persuade people, it's to get them to persuade themselves. Um, and that's not usually, I think, the way we think about going about converting people. We think, you know, attack is um, the way to go. And there are, um, there are uses for those, but if we're starting with somebody that's Christian and maybe a family member, um, trying not to persuade might be, might be a good strategy. Um, I probably shouldn't relate the story, but I'm going to anyway. Um, so, my husband, um, when we first got married, was Catholic. And I also was, Catholic, was going to become Catholic and then got a cold feet, not about the wedding, but about the Catholicism, um, and said, well, well, can we do it after the wedding? And the priest was fine with it, and he's a great guy. Uh, went ahead and married us anyway, even though I wasn't Catholic, and then I just never went through with it. I've been very careful not to persuade anyone in my family, uh, in my husband's family, and it's been interesting to see people going from um, very staunch <coughs> Christian, very anti-atheist, to now, my mother-in-law the other day told me that um, she didn't understand why people got so upset about gay people because they're just people just like everyone else and you know, shouldn't we be caring about what people are doing instead of what they're believing? She would not have said that 10 years ago when we got married. Um, so, you know, it takes a long time. It's 
might be in for the long haul, but this can be a successful strategy. Um, and the reason baby steps are sometimes useful um, is this idea of latitudes of acceptance and latitudes of rejection. Um, so psychologists have been sort of aware of this idea for quite a while that people sort of have, uh, you know, like a sort of a range of beliefs that they consider acceptable. And then at some point they get to beliefs where they just don't really care and then they have the latitude of rejection and those are things that are crazy, insane, and I don't agree with at all. What happens is you can get, basically get people to move to the, on this sheet, like the, from dark blue to light blue, and then light blue becomes dark blue. And get them to move all the way again to light blue. And what people do is they readjust. So you can get them to move gradually in baby steps, their latitudes of acceptance, to eventually include things that were originally in the latitude of rejection. Um, so we have maybe, um, you know, secular humanists might be the first step, and then by the end, uh, we were talking a little bit last time about people like J.T. Eberhard, um, who is a little bit more um, anti-theist. Uh, we get there eventually, right? So he might be in the dark red um, to somebody that's Christian, but over time maybe they get involved in the commun humanist community, and then he's not in the red anymore, he's sort of in the white or even, even in the blue. But these things happen gradually. Um, so these latitudes can be narrow or wide, and then um, depending on uh, people's certainty or knowledge determines the narrowness or wideness of the latitude. So we can have two strategies. We can either try to shift the latitudes over, or we can make them a little bit wider. So making them wider was what we were talking about last time, and then shifting them is what we're talking about this time. Um, it's sort of connected if you've been there, or if you've been here for miles. Um, so do you guys have any questions for people that want to be on the sure. Is it Dan? Yeah. Are there um, more or less specific time frames known for this process? Uh, no. No. There, I don't think that there's very much research on how long it takes somebody to, um, we would call it recenter. I, I don't know how long it would take to recenter. Um, it's a psychological process, so it could happen very quickly for some people, perhaps, and it could happen very slowly. I would imagine it varies as much as people's conversion stories, so um, I won't name names since we're trying to protect people's anonymity, but you know, a few people said that they had converted fairly recently, other people were raised um, from the beginning as atheists, so same, same thing there. Some people, it's a gradual process, other people, I think somebody last time sort of talked about it as if they just sort of woke up one day and were like, this is crap, I must be an atheist, right? So that would be a very quick move from the blue to the Other questions? I have a question. Um, are there differences across culture or gender around these issues, mm -hmm. such as maybe some cultures it's more, there's more acceptance for a more central route, other cultures it's more peripheral, or men or women might have different responses to different messages? I can't answer the question of culture because I'm not aware of any cultural research on the ELM, um, there doesn't seem to be any differences of gender that like, men or women are more likely to be influenced by um, strong or weak arguments. I would, I would assume that I answered these questions a little bit, sure. but I mean I would assume that there are, because people are so different and because we all have different modes and ways of communicating depend on the culture that you're in, Sure. Um, that probably with, within some groups where interpersonal communication is maybe, and processes are maybe more, um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly. More but, direct? Or? Yeah, more direct, more. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm thinking that there, that I mean, I'm sure that there are differences across culture. Okay. Let's study it. Yes. Let's see if we're in. I was trying to get out of academia. <laughs> Sucked back in. <laughs> I don't think that there's, there's a yeah. yeah. <laughs> We, we generally see see in the lab that it's things like importance of the topic that determines, or <coughs> the time to think about it that determines whether you're thinking a lot versus thinking little. Mm -hmm. Cultural differences. I'm not sure. Somebody else? Yeah, I would think the religion that you're in would be harder to convert than others. Like the the Islams, if they you know lose their faith, they get killed, which is incentive yeah. not to yes. become atheists. <laughs> And then the Catholics, if they convert, they didn't become, they go to hell. So yeah. there's, there's varying degrees of what happens if you drop your faith. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, although the Catholic priest that I mentioned that um, married me, I just it just occurred to me that he could get in trouble if somebody ever figured, if somebody did the research and figured out who he was. But anyway, he once anonymously said, but I knew who it was on a on a message board um, on my sister-in-law's blog, who's a kind of well-known Catholic blogger, um, that it wasn't actually true that all atheists would go to hell. That his reading of the Bible said that, um, and it was about I I guess broke for her, so it was basically somebody was like, who, who cares about you, you're going to hell anyway, and so it came to my defense and was like, well, she's a good person, and I happen to know her, and so I don't think that she's going to hell. Well, I think the Pope said that. Yes, he did. Yeah. He didn't put on the Vatican, we're all, and we're like, wait a second. Like, <laughs> <laughs> don't go that far. We have to get the donations, man. Don't tell people that it's okay, we don't believe. <laughs> this is related to what Joe is talking about. I've heard stories of Russian physicists who are very combative, and that is how they choose to operate. And they'll mm -hmm. go into the other person's office and say, and write their idea, and the other guy's like, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard, and they'll just mm -hmm. like fight about it. And, yeah. and I guess that's you know very passionate for them, and uh -huh. um, maybe it, I mean, they believe it's effective, I guess, because yeah. they do it, but I don't know, maybe it'd be better if they were nicer. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> well, it depends. but there is that strategy. Yeah, it, that's a little bit different, I think, those ideas that have to do with science, because there is an objective right answer, I would imagine, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're wrong, it'll eventually come to you that, oh, crap, I was wrong. But with religion, you know, it's pretty subjective, so no one's really been able to prove consistently one way or another. We're all sort of, you know, stating our opinions. Let me show you my theorem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can we copyright it? <laughs> sure. And at least on the gender issue, at least as it regards religion, my thoughts on it would be that it's also harder probably to change your mind when you're changing something that is a strong identity marker that also gives you your social, um, your social capital, your social worth. And since I believe, and I, I haven't, I don't recall research that I've read, but like I do believe this that it's been out there that women tend to be more involved in church. Mm -hmm. And so if that's getting them like, this is what I do with my Sundays, and this is where I get my friends, and this is you know, where I get my love and acceptance, I would, I would expect that that would make them less likely to change their minds quickly mm -hmm. on that issue because you're not only fighting their beliefs, you're also fighting their identity markers and their social the social, social capital. Or, yeah, their social capital. Yeah. Or, or, you know, it could be like those clergy that are non believers and they can't leave the community. Because I've definitely heard, I, I, I've heard of and I've known a few people, and I personally like to go to mass. I don't do it all the time because it's kind of inconvenient, but um, there are probably other people when I'm in there, I can't be the only atheist. Well, I'm not the only atheist because my husband's usually with me. It's been shown that women in general are actually more involved in community building activities, and that's one of the reasons that development is actually a third, well, it's a woman's issue, really, right. mm -hmm. especially with children. So what you're pointing to is it isn't just you know a religion, it's in general, mm -hmm. women are more linked to community building activities. Isn't it like the consciousness, or I've heard people say that it's not gonna be a matter of converting their ideas, it's gonna be a matter of building consciousness, like a total social consciousness away from that or you know, it makes me think that these big ideas are built on smaller ideas that really that we can address one at a time you know I think a lot of theists are theists because they engage in a kind of wishful thinking mm -hmm. and then they belong to communities and tell them that it's okay yes and then it pervades their lives they engage in wishful thinking in all sorts of things well validation and is an important function of groups we're all here validating you know, each other's beliefs exactly so I think you know a generation ago or two generations ago mm -hmm. it was perfectly acceptable to engage in things like racist thinking yes. you know that's just not that people mm -hmm. when people do that they're instantly corrected mm -hmm. and isolated and, and made to understand that that's yes. that's incorrect and mm -hmm. that you know that's a in a way is a smaller idea that pervades their larger ideas mm -hmm. or that uh, I don't know my idea is my thinking is is that maybe it's more appropriate to to call people out on uh, smaller things like wishful thinking, mm -hmm. you know, or to identify what are what is the problem? With, what is the problem with their thinking? I don't even think that you need to call them out on it. Mm -hmm. oh. If you just plant little messages and cues, like for instance, this is not health related, but in my classes I teach about marriage and family, 
and I always tell people, and I tell you know, I talk about child free people and people who don't want children. I'm like, you all know you don't have to have kids if you choose not to have them. Mm -hmm. It's not it's your choice. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I you know, I kind of plant little not that I'm trying to get people not to have children. Right. <laughs> but what I'm my the objective is to help people understand that you don't have to live up to societal exactly. demands and standards. Mm -hmm. In the same way, I also try to plant the seed that, hey, just because you've always followed the tradition of religion, because I think that's the main reason people go to church is because it's what they've always done. It's the way things have always been. Right. You know, planting little seeds of, right, things have always been that way, um, you know, or in the 1950s, racism was the norm, and that was the way things were always done, but until one person decides to not follow the social norm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. I don't even know that you have to be in their face. You just I don't think so either. See. I think in your face is really yeah. good. For it is good for some. Yes, things. and the audience. You know, so a lot of times yeah. you might hear. Um, so I know JT and Greta Christina both. Who, and you know, PP Myers. I read a lot of these blogs, and they'll post letters that they've gotten from somebody like, I never thought about people can ever question these things, and I sort of was mad at you at the time, and then I let it sort of marinate. Yeah. Um, I've actually had people come back to me and say, well, if anything from child being child, I never thought that I could do something different. It's like, well, no, you can't. Yeah, my students. You, know, you have to go by society. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh. And you can almost see it going through in his head like, but you're so normal. So last time we talked about our coming out stories where you come out to somebody and they're like, oh, you're such a normal person. How can you also be atheist? Um, and it's because, you know, we have stereotypes. And if the face of atheism is sort of, have you guys seen that meme online about the, it's like a pimply faced kid and he's like, come debate me or something, and he looks very smug and he's young. And if that's the idea that you have about humanists and atheists, you might not join a group like this because you might assume that there aren't people like you. And I think that it's really poignant that when you guys were telling your stories of how you got involved, a lot of the time it was through these communities that you might have had more in common with. So the crafting club. Um, or the book club, or um, chicks and chocolate. Uh, so people sort of get involved that way sometimes. So a similar group to um, the larger, less homogenous group, um, or larger, more homogenous group. So this brings me to the next point, and um, it's just a small point that I feel I, for social justice reasons, I. Uh, especially given some of the comments that have been made by national organizations lately. So um, there's a lot of arguing, arguing out there in the movement about diversity and whether or not we should have, should, like, so should heathen chicks be allowed to exist because it's not allowing men, and that's bad. Um, or day of solidarity for black non-believers, well that leaves out white people, so that's bad too. Um, so the reason that these things are, are important is that diversity isn't something that just happens on its own. If you leave things to their own devices, groups become more homogenous over time because basically the people that are the minority either feel awkward or out of place or they might be ostracized um, directly. And so we have to be cognizant of um, welcoming people with different backgrounds. So secular women, um, black atheists, they're not a bad thing for the movement. Um, and I think the stories that you guys said actually are the best evidence of that, that most of you guys got involved in this community through some of these more um, narrow focused groups rather than um, coming to the humanist community directly. Um, and the most important stage, I think, is when people are not meeting their needs to belong, what they do is they choose groups, and when groups are looking for new, new members, they recruit members with mutual goals. So if we have diversity as a goal, we won't pay attention to the fact that, you know, it appears that we're mostly white. Um, we're a good mix between men and women. Um, there's not too many kids in here, though. Um, and instead, we'll focus on the goals. And there are lots of different humanist groups in Central Ohio and across the nation, and which ones you identify with probably depend on what goals you have. So this is more of a um, service-minded group. Um, CFI uh, is, is a lot about um, more science and skepticism. Um, drinking skeptically is uh, about drinking <laughs> with atheists. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, yeah, when you drink skeptically, make sure you have a skeptical. Fuzzy Beers is not a drink fest. I know. People usually yeah. have like one or two beers mm -hmm. or ciders yeah. and burgers and just yeah. very nice people. Mm -hmm. very I've been, so I was at TAM a couple years ago and they had like a skeptics in the pub and it was a major drunken fest. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would, that, that's my only experience with them. Con? No, I was at TAM. Oh, oh okay. Right. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. Well, I was in Vegas. So Oh, and so the last thing was I want to encourage you guys to um, help us punch cancer in the face by joining Columbus Light the Night. So that's a good, going back to the goals of, you know, tolerance and getting atheists included in the latitude of acceptance. In that sense, you know, if the goal is to fight cancer, then we're allowing, you know, our group to be included in these other groups. So essentially, the way that these two talks fit together is that, you know, being more accepted and being visible in the community allows people to realize that we're here. And there are lots of people that are experiencing these feelings of doubt or you know, being unsure about their religion. Or they're actually already atheists and they're just not sure that they want to identify and make it part of their identity. Um, and so groups like this um, and you know, Camp Quest, SSA, there are lots of great Central Ohio groups that are you know, national organizations. Uh, really do a good job of 
not directly persuading people. So shutting off the counter argument and defensiveness that maybe allows more people to be open. Um, and then, you know, JT and PZ and Greta can come in and make us all very certain that we're right with their brand of firebrandedness. <laughs>